Chapter 8 By the time George and Tanith bid their friends Archibald and Juna farewell, they had long since become accustomed to the sulfurous scent on the air. It meant the river was flowing hot and strong again. Mill wheels turned, the waterfall tumbled, and families went swimming in the middle of a lustrous winter. Handmaidens gave the dog and the drake thorough baths and spring water pumped into the castle. Cooks brought them more dried meat than they could carry. Townspeople waved and patted their heads. Tanith struggled to understand this positive attention. She was used to people being afraid of her, as they had been when she pretended to be a cursed demon creeping around in the shadows. Now small children were asking her to stay, hugging her neck and chasing her swinging tail. <laughs> the old gray unicorn horn that was once mounted on the wall of the Great Hall was now strapped to her back, a final gift. What a wonderful country, George commented as they returned to the road. He had to pick up his paws to get through a dense layer of snow while Tanith padded across the surface. I am surprised you did not choose to stay. A castle with warm bath water is better than any cave. The dragon snorted, gushing flames. You could have stayed too, she said. Queen Juna invited you to become a knight. Why continue on this quest when you could have an entire city to love you? And so, the traveling companions determined that neither would give up their goal, thus binding them together once again. George still wanted to save the life of his master. Tanith still wanted to find a teacher. Their hearts were set. This friendly argument carried them up out of the valley, all the way out of the Winter Alps. Soon the snow began to melt and turned to slush that they had to splash through. Evergreen woods mixed with groves of deciduous trees that were at first bare, but soon had little buds growing along their branches. Honking geese were everywhere. Blue jays squawked. Butterflies drifted past in search of flowers opening their petals to the cloudy sky. The road twisted around hills and frequently met with a bridge leaping over a cheerful stream. Archways of weeping willow branches swept the cobblestones. When Tanith's scales brightened from black to emerald green, George knew they had reached the edge of the place known as the Spring Lakes. It was an incredible transformation to watch. She was such a vital color that if she lay down in the fresh grass, he would have lost sight of her completely. Many times, they had to take cover under a tree or bush as rainfall halted their progress. Tanith had been fine in the cold mountains, but she disliked the wetness here. The branches above their heads had only sparse, newly grown foliage to keep the pear dry. When night fell, there was nowhere dry to sleep. George shook his fur, and Tanith longed for a good rock and some sun. Sometimes lightning stopped them in their tracks. Additionally, they were constantly stumbling across fields of mud that had to be crossed, their claws squelching and slipping. They were never clean despite the spring showers. Eventually, the clouds lightened from stormy gray to cotton white, making way for sunshine. Tanith sighed with relief as the first strong rays touched her hide. Her new green color was especially vibrant in the sun. The trees on either side of the road unfurled their leaves to drink in this nourishment. Apple blossoms hugged by bumblebees bloomed with such enthusiasm that their petals became a different sort of rain. As they danced along a path turned pink, George pointed out red-breasted robins in the trees bringing food for their cheeping fledglings. Then Tanith found a patch of tulips. She paused to admire the red ones. I am glad not to be so dingy anymore, the baby drake said. Brown and black are such drab colors. I do not think so. The dog replied, They remind me of home when I hunted for beetles in the bark of our oak tree. They are strong, solid colors. There are thousands of streams and rivers running through this part of the world. Bridges of every kind cross them. Some are made of wood and iron, while others are pieced together with bricks, rose quartz, or granite. Meanwhile, the road climbed hill after hill as the travelers bore deeper into the giant watershed separating the Winter Alps from the Spring Lakes. At midday, George and Tanith came across their first lake. Standing on the pebbles at the shore, they looked out at the calm water, just able to make out the far side. Mallards floated by with their ducklings, unbothered by a moose passing by taking long, lazy strides through the reeds. Her baby followed on gangling legs. Ripples appeared randomly on the surface as fish ventured up for a glimpse of the sky, mindful of herons and eagles. 
George and Tanith also found themselves looking to the sky when an enormous shadow fell over them, blocking out the sun they had just been reacquainted with. There was a moment of terrible disorientation and fear as the dog and the baby drake were scooped up by unknown hands, swept into the dark belly of an unknown beast, and accosted by an unknown voice. Ahoy! The gruff voice cried. Welcome aboard the Hornswaggle, we travelers. With much relief and delight, George saw that he and Tanith were being carried up onto the deck of a ship. A dozen men and women wearing bandanas on their heads, leather boots on their feet, and an assortment of vests, stripes, coats, and belts. They grinned at the pair through shaggy beards woven with beads. One had an eye patch, one had a peg leg, and another had a gold tooth. The man who had spoken was the most impressive of all. His beard was the frizziest, his hat was the biggest, his black coat was the grandest, and he had the most earrings, bracelets, and rings. On his shoulder sat a bird whose orange, scarlet, and maroon feathers caught the sunshine and flashed bright as flames. It had eagle talons and glaring eyes. Tanith hunched down close to the floorboards while George lifted his head and wagged his tail. With a booming laugh, the pirate dropped to one knee and scratched the mutt's ears. Aye, what a good boy ye are, me hearty, he said. The best scurvy dog of us all. His crew guffawed in response, and Tanith began to relax. She looked around at the ship while everyone was distracted by George's slobbery smile. The hornswaggle bucked and swayed under her feet, but she quickly realized that it was not sitting on the water. Looking up, there were no sails, but three hot air balloons. They were quilted together from thousands of pieces of cloth in every color and pattern. An iron furnace sat beneath each one, pumping heat into the giant sacks. You get your breeze legs soon enough, little landlubber, a crew member assured her, watching the dragon tip and stumble as the deck moved under her feet. The open ocean is far more treacherous than the gentle currents here. The pirate leader got to his feet to address everyone gathered. His pet phoenix opened its wings and fluttered away to perch on the ship's wheel. Avast, he boomed. Ye have been taken aboard the marauding ship Hornswaggle as guests of myself and me crew. I am Captain Tom, and these are the Blue Buccaneers. Blue? Tanith asked. Of course, Blue, Captain Tom bellowed. Have a look broadside. Doing as the pirate instructed, George and Tanith tripped their way to the side of the ship to see over the parapet. They gasped at the sight. The Hornswaggle was gliding on the air, far, far above the lakes and streams below. Flocks of seagulls flew underneath them. The ship's reflection in the water was hard to make out, and the two squinted until they realized that this was not just because they were up so high. The hull was painted sky blue. They were nearly invisible, inconspicuous as a cloud's shadow passing over a meadow. I never thought of blue as a scary color, Tanith said. But it must be simple to sneak up on people and steal from them when they cannot see your ship coming. Captain Tom shook his head, looking very serious. We do not steal anymore, he said. Not for many years. Now we are pirates and marauders in name only, sailing the seven skies in search of adventure and people in need. That is why we picked up you travelers. Crossing the spring lakes on foot takes thrice as long as any other country. The road winds endlessly. We will take you where you need to be. That is very kind of you, Captain, George said gratefully. The baby dragon, on the other hand, was confused. Why did you stop stealing when you are pirates? That is what a pirate is meant to do. We were sailors first, pirates second, Captain Tom said, swinging his arm wide to indicate the whole crew. There came a day when we looked around and saw that we had no friends, no family, and very little treasure to our name. We pillaged, plundered, and looted to distract ourselves from how lonely we were, and it made us even lonelier. The Hornswaggle was a fearsome man of war. No one was happy to see us when we made port. No, we burned our black balloons and sold new ones. Every day we remind ourselves not to go back to the way we were. As Captain Tom told the story of how the Blue Buccaneers took stock and changed their ways, he gave them a tour of the ship. 
They leaned over the edge to glimpse the figurehead in the shape of a phoenix. They were shown how the hot air balloons were kept full without causing the hornswaggle to drift off into outer space. They looked through the spyglass to see rabbits, ducklings, and spotted fawns. The spring lakes were so clear and calm that they resembled a thousand mirrors laid on the ground, hugging the curve of the earth, reflecting the beautiful sky back at itself. Finally, George and Tanith were invited into the captain's quarters. They stepped inside and were met with yet another surprise. Every table and chair, every corner, every shelf and cabinet had an instrument sitting on it. Guitars, drums, fiddles, flutes, tambourines, and even a giant piano crowded the opulent room. I no longer sleep in here, Captain Tom said. I prefer to stay below with the crew. Now that we are not busy being pirates all day, we have all the time in the world to be musicians. <laughs>